Welcome, everybody, to another edition of Coffee and Open Source, a place to meet some new friends, have some great conversations, and maybe learn something along the way. I'm your host, Isaac Levin. If you're enjoying the interviews here, be sure to like, subscribe, follow, wherever you're watching or listening. Also, if you're interested or know any folks that would be interested in coming on and chatting with me, feel free to reach out to me on Twitter. My handle there is IsaacR11. All right, so with that, let's get started. I got some coffee. It's probably a little bit too late for coffee for me, but we're going to do it anyway. So today, I'm excited for my guest. My guest is David Pine. David, do you want to say hello? Introduce yourself? Hi, friends. David Pine here. Uh, yeah, um, uh, big fan of tech, open source, uh, software development, .NET, C Sharp, TypeScript, Angular, all the things. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm sure we'll cover more things as we get into the conversation. <laughs> I hope so, because we're going to be talking for about an hour, and if it's just us not talking about anything, that's a bummer. <laughs> um, yeah, I think a good way to get started is definitely, I would love to kind of hear your tech origin story. So do you remember that point in time where, you know, depending, to, regardless of how old you were, when you came across tech and you were like, okay, this is the thing, like this is what I'm, I'm interested in, and I want to kind of do this sort of stuff for my the rest of my professional career, and maybe even my life. Yeah, um, so I, I think... One of those moments, uh, there was an epiphany when I was in middle school because I was a a big um, consumer of first person shooter games like Quake sure. and sure. Half Life. Um, but I was always intrigued by like the 3D environments and mm. like the models that run around and like the individual framework of animating a character and you know putting lights inside a map and how does that actually work and what are the physics engines like. Uh, so I actually started designing levels. Um, I was using Quark, which is Quake Army Knife. Yep. Um, and it basically lets you just kind of rip down all the polygons. You get into like a 3D environment and you build these things out and you try to compile it and it would generate like, you know, um, uh, partitioned um, binary environments sure. and uh it, it was a lot of fun and i did the same thing with half-life too there was um mm -hmm. valve hammer they it was from steam they had like a level editor there so i really enjoyed that uh kind of game development yeah. aspect of it but then later on you know through high school and um you know post high school i i didn't feel like there was many opportunities where i lived i lived in the midwest so um at the time you know this is 12 15 18 long, a long time ago many years yep. ago <laughs> yep. um, i know we're getting to an age where we're like oh it's like decades now uh oh gosh yeah wait so if i'm 37 i'm talking about middle school so that's yeah that's a long time ago right <laughs> um but there wasn't many opportunities in the midwest for game developers so mm -hmm. it was it wasn't something that i you know immediately was uh you know thought could be my reality um so then I ended up going to college and uh, for computer information systems and, you know, graduated and was lucky to get a job before I even graduated yeah. um, as a junior developer. And, uh, uh, you know, I guess the rest is history. Um, starting that career out, though, it was really there was some intimidating moments because I was the only junior developer on a team that was all tech leads. So there was oh, no okay. like mid tier people right and uh, all right I, I didn't really have like a mentor or anything so it's kind of like you know you're just kind of thrown into it and you're like mm -hmm. you know sink or swim right yeah uh so that's been my philosophy for my entire career is that whole sink or swim mentality yeah. so I, i've done a ton of stuff to kind of level up myself and, and learn more and i'm always you know uh hungry to to try out new things and see what they're all about um yeah yeah, it's kind of funny, like, depending on that, what that first job is, right? Like, how, what kind of person in technology are you become? Like, do you become kind of like that Swiss Army knife generalist sort of thing where it's like, hey, the young guy or the young gal or the young person, go ahead and do that. Like, get this done, right? I always, right. like, the first job that I took, like, I was in a similar boat where, you know, most of the folks on my team, they were published authors, like, on O'Reilly books, and, like, they were, you know high up in the organization and it was just me and like I kind of got a lot of the bottom feeder work like hey we need you to research like CMSs can you like research all the CMSs because we're looking to maybe redo our CMS publicly right like a lot of work that a senior developer would probably have no interest in really doing but I think the only really difference is that I was fortunate to have um, 
the senior folks on the team were like really keen on like making sure that I was set up for success, which um, like I, I was very, very grateful for because I think I could have struggled mightily with that little bit of guidance because I think I, you know, even today with being as senior as I am, quote unquote senior, not title wise, <laughs> uh, I, I feel like I'm all over the place all the time. So like without, without some guidance or without like some, some goal, I end up just kind of, Hey, maybe do this, do this, do this, there's a little bit too much ADHD, but, um, so you got started, um, you know, at a, in a, what was it about, and have you been like a web-based developer your entire career or did you kind of do like a little bit of everything and then you fell into the web and, um, that's kind of where you're interested kind of sat? Uh, yeah, no, I didn't do web for a while. Actually, when I first started out, um, we were building, um, desktop applications for mm. testing vehicle emissions. So we were working actually against the, uh, OBD. So it's like a, an onboard diagnostics protocol. Is that the thing that and, you plug in under your dash that, yeah, yeah. 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 So and that and, you know, dynamometers and stuff like that. And I remember some of the, the C++ developers um, uh, very vividly, uh, they would go debug the dynamometers with a vehicle attached to it, you know, and they're right in front of it, you know, hooked up to the hardware. And I'm thinking to myself, they got a vehicle that's going like, you know, 75 miles sure, an hour sure, sure. on these dynamometers and they're testing out their stuff. Like, what if there's a while loop that messes up and boom, oh, it drops? Yeah. And, yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? So it's like, oh, uh, so yeah, th my first exposure was, um, you know, desktop apps. And then we actually did some, um, windows, uh, like the compact edition, like the, you know, WinForms mini, like, sure. And then, uh, yeah, I, I mean, it was like HTTP at that point in time to me was like a foreign concept, like mm, as, as a desktop okay. developer, it's like, you know, there was some soap services that would get called and it sure. was just really like, here's some contracts and then we wait for the information to come back. And so I didn't get my first experience in web development until uh, my, my second job. Um, and we were doing web forms. So <laughs> we probably can put like air yeah. quotes around web developer experience. Sure. <laughs> I mean, web, web forms, forms is, I web mean, forms, web forms still kicks. I don't care what anybody says. <laughs> build, build an application today, web forms, 15 minutes, everything else, more than that, guaranteed. <laughs> You're not going to enjoy it, but it's going to get it done. It's like wind forms, right? Like not to yeah, get yeah. like super in the weeds, but like there's a reason why some of these technologies are never going to go away, but that's a different conversation for a different day, I think. Yeah, yeah. No, they certainly have their place. Um, and I think there's a lot to be learned from them. Uh, you know, one of the key things that always jumps out to me is at the time, I didn't realize what web forms was trying to actually achieve because sure. they were masking so much of it. So like as a developer who's trying to learn this new technology, uh, you know, after having worked with it for a long time and then really learning like the web, like, you know, here's pure HTML, here's pure CSS, here's vanilla JavaScript, and here's what you can do with it. Like, and here's the HTTP protocol and here's how things go over the wire. Uh, you know, it was designed to be stateless. Uh, so, you know, web forms had this, you know, view state nightmare. I remember there was times where, um, in production, some of our apps would just seize up and it's yeah. like, oh, one of the, the, you know, database administrators discovered that the view state mistakenly wasn't purged from this. Sure. So then there's like terabytes of view state just being yeah. deleted from mm -hmm. the tables in production while yeah. it's being used and it just seizes the entire app up. And it's like, oh my God, this is craziness. So, yeah, it, it is pretty, like, you know, to think about how dependent we were on some technologies that I don't, you know, and this is, and maybe this is just me as kind of an, uh, an uninformed developer, how many things we just had no, like, no recollect, like, understanding of, like, the session state, view state, like, that was for, like, okay, I'll read some documentation, I'll read maybe some samples on, like, you know, Code Magazine or whatever, the um, magazine, MSDN Magazine, I think, at the time. Right, right. It's like, okay, I'll, I'll follow some of this stuff. I have no idea what's actually happening. And if it works, awesome. If it doesn't work, rut row, right? Like, I think that's... on my machine, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, that, the my machine <laughs> thing is always funny because right. we're getting... Uh, we're getting closer and closer to the my machine not being a problem still still a problem but i think back then specifically like especially talking about like scale like you can never build an application that scales only on your machine right like you have to think about it in different constructs um but that's that's absolutely a, yeah there, there's no way to write an app right now that you know you know locally and test it out that says hey uh, this is ready for black friday yeah yeah i think that's that's a really 
yeah, it's it's funny too because like we're all responsible, and this is probably going to be a rant, so I apologize. Like we always <laughs> talk about like build, how you know building these cloud native applications, how important it is, and Kubernetes and all this stuff, and the developer tooling for all of it is challenging. Even like the good developer tools, like it's still like the concepts are really hard, right? Mm-hmm. The concepts are really hard, as well as like trying to figure out like okay, I'm I'm dependent on all these external services that I can never actually I'll never get on my machine. Like, I'm not going to, like, spin up, like, a local Redis on my box. I mean, I guess you can in some cases, but, like, all these things that you're, quote-unquote, dependent of in a cloud-native environment, like, you're not, never going to stand one up and then hit it with 4,000 requests a millisecond, right? Right. So, like, you know, I always have a lot of empathy for folks that have to think about things like that, like the, the engineers at Netflix or whatever, or the engineers at some other, um, like, big service that's just getting hit, like, hammered constantly. Exactly. Well, I think at least having that bit of knowledge is something that takes like an average developer a while, right? Like they, there's, there's not, it's not too often that you see, you know, uh, younger, uh, early career devs coming out of college with that like foresight that like, oh, we have to be prepared for that. And I don't know if that has to do with like the college, uh, colleges or what they're educating people on, but I mean, that's a whole other conversation. Yeah, I don't want to get into it because I've done it so many <laughs> times where I've kind of ranted about the current um, the current climate or the current ecosystem for university uh, curriculum. Did you uh, go to, like do a computer science curriculum in college or did you yes. go through like yeah. an information systems that was more business oriented? No, it was, uh, computer information systems, but engineering. Yeah. So like you had to care about things like big O notation and, um, mm-hmm. you know, I guess traditional object oriented practices, right? Like, yeah, yeah. They taught me Java, so they that's... taught you Java. Well, that's good. Mm-hmm. I mean, I th- I uh, I changed majors. I was a computer science major, and then I had to like program an ATM machine using C, and I was like, nope, I'm good. This is <laughs> this is not my thing. Um, so I switched over to like a more business specific major that was like information systems. I guess you can say it's part of the business curriculum, um, and was substantially more comfortable, I guess you could say. Um, yeah. yeah, so, I mean, so you kind of moved over to the web space and you said you hadn't had a lot of, like, experience in, like, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Um, like, I always liked the... Did you ever do, like, the MySpace thing where, like, you just completely would create, like, crazy profile pages in MySpace? Or was that something that you didn't do? Because I've talked no, to a lot of no. people and a lot of people have done that where... You know, their first foray into like web development was like, oh, I can customize my MySpace page with like dropping CSS page CSS on it <laughs> or JavaScript because like no. it was it was free form text that you can just drop anything in the browser, just run it, which right. it was always funny because you could like crash browsers with like some really good profiles. Um, no, no, I did not do that. No, it, no, I, I did start progressing into a more mature, uh, you know, stack though. So from web forms, I went to. Uh, I started doing consulting, and then mm-hmm. I was uh, had my first go at um, Angular JS. Yep. You know, before okay. yep. the, the latest Angular. OG came out, Angular. So. OG, OG Angular. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And that was that was eye opening. Um, yeah. Because it's like, wow, this is really, really opinionated, right? Really mm-hmm. well thought out, but it played well with. Um, at the time, we were actually using .NET as well as our mm-hmm. our host, like so ASP.NET Core, and the so like some of the spa services stuff and we were writing enterprise um applications and it was it was actually really really cool yeah i think the like the spa like the idea of the spa framework is like that origin is so fun is so funny to me we i got started like using a framework called dojo which i don't think exists anymore um and then yeah like a job that i then had used angular js and i remember like that was the first thing i thought of too is like oh this is a very opinionated way of doing things and i don't hate it and then right. obviously i think you know javascript frameworks took off around that time <clears throat> right there was a million a million of them came out and then kind of we've settled on 15 i guess now or whatever that number is but um have you always was angular like the one that you kind of tethered yourself to like have you done like a lot of react work or a lot of view or svelte or next I've, or uh, i've done view i've done svelte um, I, I've forced myself to do React probably three different times. Like, well, I keep three going ways back to, to, it. to build them too, right? They keep changing <laughs> the way you build them. Yeah, right, right. I, I think I did that because I was such a big proponent of what Google had done with Angular. Mm-hmm. And um, 
we ended up landing back on Angular when we we started rewriting the apps from the ground up. Um, so we ripped out Angular JS and we had like this foundation of what we thought was a vision of how we could build apps. And then you know Angular came out and we're like, wow, this is so much better than what we were doing because you know TypeScript was formalized as like a first class citizen yeah. and. To me, um, I've I've spoken so many times about TypeScript because I love it. I love what Anders has done for JavaScript. You know, the type system is absolutely amazing, and um, you can't convince me otherwise. Uh, yeah. uh, but no, the, the, just the fact that Angular made that a first class citizen. So it was it was really cool to see kind of you know Microsoft and Google coming together in this open way, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, we talk about open source, but uh, you know, TypeScript's open source and uh, Angular's open source and, you know, Edge is, you know, based on Chromium, which is open source. It's like all these cool things mm -hmm. that are happening and these when these collaborations occur, like that's the best of uh, everything just kind of melding together. So uh, Angular was again like its predecessor Angular JS very opinionated but it brought a bunch of very common best practices like you know dependency injection and you know like i said the type system and all those things and it, it made it a joy it, it was yeah. something i actually really liked doing yeah i mean especially if you come from that world where like you maybe you're a java developer or c sharp developer or whatever like there's some intr intrinsic experiences that are kind of built in to how you build apps and i mean typescript kind of brings that to a model that's hasn't that was never like that initially right mm -hmm. like i think that's what's very very interesting about typescript specifically is like yeah there's a bit more of ceremony like building a typescript app but it's to make your life easier right like instead of the browser just crashing all the time like or your you know your console log filling up when you're trying to debug stuff like oh like before i like build this application before i run it like i can be told hey you're missing a semicolon here or hey like right. this is exactly. going to, like this is going to like are you do you really want double equals or do you want triple equals like stuff like that right where right. you know a, as a common developer who's not a genius it's like okay well i'd spend 2 hours trying to figure out why this code doesn't work and it's like literally like a, a triple equals of a double equals or some silly example right yeah yeah that's why i've always referred to as you know typescript is basically JavaScript with training wheels, right? Yeah. And there's another analogy that comes to mind. So I think Jonathan Mills, um, I, re I recall a conference I was at a long time ago and he presented this analogy and it's stuck with me, but um, so forgive me if it's a bit off uh, or if there's like a formal quote from him or something, but sure. he, he kind of discusses like how, uh, you know, websites or web apps, you know, they can be served anywhere around the world. Mm -hmm. So you, the developer, you put your code up into a web server and that request comes across uh, the response, you know, serves it. And then JavaScript, uh, JavaScript starts executing on some remote client. You have no yeah. idea where it is. Exactly. And if an error occurs, what happens? Yeah. The developer doesn't have any idea, right? They've already pushed their stuff. They're, you know, having a great weekend or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then meanwhile, you know, so it's like TypeScript really helps alleviate a lot of those little kind of paper yeah. cuts in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as somebody who has had the luxury of like working with actual like qu quality assurance engineers, like mm -hmm. and like going through that experience, like have oh by the way, you, you, like can you debug this front end too? Can you test this front end? Like, I mean, I don't think like quality assurance analysts don't really exist very much anymore. Like, it's all like oh you can write web tests for this or smoke tests or whatever. Like that experience was always so challenging, right? Like even like in the Angular JS days, where it's just like, okay, does it work? Oh, it doesn't work. Okay, give me five minutes. Does it work now? Okay, it doesn't right. work. Like that loop is just painful, right? Like I think, like adding tools that make that loop either not exist or way tighter, just makes developers' lives easier. Like I joke that being a developer now, there's all these options, so things are really challenging to make decisions, but like the loop itself is substantially tighter. The frustration is, is there's too many tools and too many options to do stuff. Right. And I, I think, you know, some of my earlier career experiences with like Angular JS and stuff, like finding bugs in production, like, you know, before it's the start of the weekend and before having like really strict, like, you know, continuous integration and continuous deployment mechanisms, you know, I'd find myself on the production server tweaking JS files. And it's like, oh, this is fun. <laughs> yeah. And also like, 
you know, not to knock JavaScript, I feel like I keep on knocking JavaScript, but like the error message are usually not very clear, especially like with frameworks. Like I remember Angular JS, like if I got an error message and I couldn't figure out, like if I couldn't stack overflow properly, like stack overflow search, I was in for a rough time. Like, yeah. because a lot of the error messages are very similar, right? With like, maybe like a module name being different. And it's like, okay, there's 400 reasons why this might, might not work. All right. right. So go, th- go through all of them. Right. Um, you have, you know, with, with more strongly typed programming languages, at least the error messages are a bit less opaque. I mean, they're mm-hmm. still opaque in some regards, like if you're doing async await stuff or, or whatever. Right. Um, but at the end of the day, like the debugging experience is, is way better for TypeScript and JavaScript. So like if you right. have the ability to, to choose one, like I think it's a no brainer. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, that just makes me think like, you know, like through the progression of my career, like, you know, once I got into Angular, we were to the point where in my career where I was, um, I was the UI lead for a while on a team and we were writing an application for Stanford University. Sure. And it was wow. for the central energy plant optimization. So it's it's working with all these, you know, PhDs and there was like low level MATLAB implementations of how to optimize the central energy plant based on, you know, weather predictions based on whether or not there's going to be students in the university at the time because their yeah. body warmth and like there's, you know, all these different things that come into account. So, uh, you know, eventually I ended up becoming um, a solution architect and, you know, I was I was helping roughly 20 different software engineering teams kind of imposing these best practices and leading them to uh you know greener pastures so to speak like i remember we rewrote some of the dotnet framework bits that they had for some of their core um web apis we did it in dotnet core mm-hmm. and simply with that rewrite and then a few other observations that we had we were able to basically make their stuff like 10x faster and they're like oh my god what did you do and it's like yeah i just relied on later you know more recent stuff <laughs> Yeah, and I think, you know, and I'd love to kind of switch a little bit from like JavaScript stuff to talking about .NET because it kind of alludes to some of the stuff that you're working on these days. Like, when did you, I guess, and you and I are similar age and we've kind of had a similar career track, right? Um, Like, when did you first come across like .NET? Like, obviously, you're an existing .NET framework developer or you're building some Mm -hmm. .NET framework, maybe with some JavaScript stuff too, but Mm -hmm. predominantly you were familiar with .NET framework. And when .NET Core comes on the scene, like how long did it take you to to kind of absorb it and start to play around with it? Was it like 1.0, 1.x, 2.0? Uh, no, for that? me, it, w- it was before that. I was in yeah. the alphas and betas. In fact, mm-hmm. I remember when I first, uh, not my first time trying to blog, like one of my second or third times trying to blog at a sure. WordPress site. Um, and I had this blog that like for me went like viral. Like I had... Mm you know, 200,000 like likes or not likes shares or something on a LinkedIn, which was like bizarre. It's like, what the heck is happening? Um, uh, but it was, it was how to meld together, um, uh, angular, like the alphabets from, you know, from, from, uh, angular and, uh, like at the time it was beta.net. Uh, sure. Core, so it, it wasn't even .NET Core at the time. It was .NET five, and it had DNX. DNX, yeah. And it had like two other utilitarian, like you know, the the version manager one, and it had all sorts of just you know project JSON stuff. And mm-hmm. I, I I had an app that I wrote that was like exemplifying how all these things came together. And you know, I think at the time there was like Gulp tasks, you know, task yeah. runner stuff, and right, all all that stuff. And people were like, "Holy cow, this is cool!" And it's like. Is it though? Like, I mean, we've come a long way since then, but it was, you know, that, that kind of, you know, foundation for, for, you know, uh, what could be. Yeah. I was a bit late to the, the game. I guess I got one dot, like one, I don't remember if it was 1.0 or 1.1, but I remember like I was reading something and I'm like, Oh, like this is cool. Cause I was in the, I was doing angular JS work. I'm like, okay, so what are some great API type options, right? For that spa model. And I came across .NET or ASP.NET Core. And I'm like, oh, okay, I'll give this a shot. And I really, really liked, you know, the built-in dependency injection, a lot of like the stuff that was just, oh, I don't have to do this by hand anymore. Like this makes my life way easier. And then right. I went to build. I remember, I don't remember what year it was. I think it was 2017 when they announced uh, .NET Core 2.0. And I like, I literally like texted my boss like while I was at build, and I was like, 
we need to, because I was at a consulting company at the time, we only should be talking about .NET Core. Like this, this is substantially easier for developers. Like I didn't, I didn't even sell them on like the, oh, it runs anywhere. Like right. I didn't sell them on any of that. I just said, it's literally easier to write apps like, li- like over .NET Framework. And, you know, ap- after going through more and more of the, some of the documentation on, I was like, on, ever since then, I, don't, I haven't built one .NET Framework application. So, right. I mean, other than for like a demo for a talk or something. So right, like, right. um, so like whenever I have to like look at .NET Framework code, like not the code itself, cause it looks very, very similar, but a lot of like yeah. the plumbing code, like the global ASAX and stuff like that. I'm like, I have no idea what's going on here. Like <laughs> I, I, if you were to ask me today, like build a .NET Framework app that did something, I'd be like, I'd be on Google a lot. Let's just say that. Now, if people, if our viewers are to rewind 15 minutes where you sure. say, give me web forms any yeah. day of the week, 15 I mean, give minutes. me what, give me web forms, <laughs> like in a, in like to solve one problem right there. Right. Right. Like, cause I mean, uh, and I think, and that's just because me personally, like I've, I've never been like a great, like UI person and like the ability to like little, like, Oh, Ajax toolkit, like, boom, I have all of this right. cool stuff. Like, and I know that like ASP.NET Core, Blazor, we could talk about all this stuff in a bit. Like a lot of that stuff is there. But like when I think of like, okay, if I need to build a website as fast as possible, like in mm-hmm. like in my lizard brain, it's like, oh, web forms is a great idea. But then like I mean like, no, that's a terrible idea, lizard brain. Don't <laughs> don't don't do that. Um, yeah. So like you got you got started on like the early bits. And I'm guessing that you kind of became a fan person really, really quickly, right? Like you just mm-hmm. were like all in, like this is it. I'm not touching yeah. anything older than this ever again. No, I still maintained. I mean, so to be clear, if I if we back up, um, you know, eight or so years in my career, I actually out of college after learning Java, uh, when I was doing uh, the WinForm stuff, we were doing that initially in VB.net. Okay. And then there was we started progressing into C sharp and I was like, Oh, this is really cool. Right. Like C sharp was like amazing. Like I, I remember some of the tech leads too. Like I, I was fascinated by like, Oh, Lambda expressions and what are these and how does this work? And what's this yield operator? Mm-hmm. And you know, how does that work with I enumerable and async and await started coming around and generics. And I was like, wow, this is, you know, it's incredible what you can actually do with some of these things. And uh, so that, that love for what C sharp, the language had to offer and the way that it's been evolving ever since, especially in the open source, um, ecosystem, you know, where so many of the features are, um, you know, come from ideation from the community and, you know, there's a formal process where there's like a proposal and then they, they put together, uh, prototypes and, you know, you can go check out a lot of this stuff right in your browser with sharplab.io and just, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's incredible. So, uh, I think for me, .NET, one of the big selling points, uh, was C sharp, the language itself. Yeah. Um, obviously the runtime, um, is a huge component of that because of all the things that it has to offer, like all the libraries, like you mentioned, dependency injection, you know, configuration options, pattern, all of these things just becoming first class citizens of the language and you know the 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 ecosystem really at that point. Yeah, I mean and that's I think that's an interesting uh delineation, right? Cuz like we talk about .net or .net framework and .net core and .net whatever, right? And C# sharp kind of synonymously is like one thing, but they're two completely different things, right? Like mm-hmm. I know you like a lot of people don't think of it like that because you write .NET apps with C Sharp, but you can write them with other languages as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but like when you start to actually learn some of these, I guess, not advanced features, but maybe intermediate, intermediate plus sort of experiences in .NET, like you have to have some visibility into what the language is actually doing, what the language allows, right? Like, mm-hmm. so, you know, is it safe to say that you've been, I don't want to, you know, you can say I'd rather not say that or whatever, but do you feel more comfortable like, do you enjoy the workings of the C-sharp language more or what like features and and stuff that's part of the the .NET platform more? No, I like it all. Uh, Yeah. uh, Okay. That's uh, very uh, holistically all. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, I advocate, I'm I'm a strong proponent of languages. So like I I shared my love for TypeScript before Mm -hmm. and I've done equally, if not more traveling and presenting on and speaking about, um, the different revs of C sharp. So, 
I've given talks about C sharp five, six, seven, eight, right? Nine, just yeah. every version. It's like, there's so many cool things out there and I love what the language is doing. Yeah. No, and that wasn't a, that wasn't an attempt to gotcha. It was more of a, like, cause I'm curious. Cause I think there's some people like, especially like if you're on like .NET Twitter, for instance, like some people are far more interested in like the inner workings of what the language is doing. Cause they're far more interested in, in some of the complex things the language is trying to solve. Mm -hmm. Other people yeah. don't care at all about the language and they're like, okay, let me show you this cool thing with this web framework or whatever, right? So right. like, yeah. But to be kind of a generalist is always good because I think one of the things that I'm very guilty of, and I think a lot of folks are probably, is like not paying as much attention to C Sharp and not using like the latest hotness that's in C Sharp, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, um, you know, like Lambda expressions and things like that. Like I think a lot of folks just, okay, I'll just do a for loop. Like I don't need, I don't need all mm -hmm. this but like, so I think that there's definitely something where, and I don't know how to really fix it about like talking about how the language can, I guess, make code more readable or more, or more efficient or whatever, right. For certain things, because mm -hmm. it is a dangerous slope. But sometimes some of the things that come out in the language make code like substantially less readable in my opinion, but that's a different Right. Thing. So, and that, well, that's, that's a really interesting thing that I want to kind of lean in on because, um, I almost to a flaw. Uh, I'm always on the bleeding edge, writing things the most expressive I can. And uh, it's almost an insult to say that my code at times is, you know, clever. Uh, sure. And I don't sure. intend for it to be. It's just, uh, you know, I've been following the language so longly that, or, or for so long that, like, that's that's just how I write code now. Uh, so, uh, but but readability is always a concern. And it's something that I think, you know, teams have to kind of set expectations of like it's disruptive for a new developer on a team to be dropped into a situation where um they have styling preferences that vary because you know there's so many different ways to do the same thing yes um where it starts to matter and where there might be internal debates is if things are adding more allocations or if things mm -hmm. are uh you know more costly in terms of performance or if things um, you know, readability is always certainly one big aspect of it. Uh, so uh, I remember, uh, you know, s since we're talking open source, you know, I maintain uh, uh, portions of the .NET docs and mm -hmm. uh, we were updating um, some of the uh, C-sharp like naming conventions and guidelines that have been in place for a while. But we were doing so basing it off of what the .NET runtime, uh, you know, prescribes to because yeah. that's that's what we're trying to capture. Like the .NET runtime team does this for this reason. So here's what these are. Yep. There's actually entire companies that base all of their rules off of those docs. So when I make changes to that, for example, teams around the world go, what are you doing? <laughs> and it's like, yeah. well, this isn't, this isn't something that you have to buy into. This is, this is optional and this is opinionated because X, Y, and Z, and this is vetted and this is based on things that are, uh, you know, already out there and, you know, are being used for a reason. So it's, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's a hot topic. <laughs> oh, for sure. And I think like, and not to get too inside baseball to use a sports cliche, but like, there's been a couple of scenarios where it's like the community's like, why is this, why is this a thing? Like nobody wants this. Right. And there's all, and it's so funny watching like to your point about having these sort of conversations in the open because I, I've said this a million times in my professional career, like you're never going to get the best feedback from people that don't like something. Like you're always going to get like, you're going to get the best feedback from those sort of folks. Like even if it's unhelpful, like people are very vocal when they don't like stuff. Like that just doesn't go in tech, but that goes in life in general, yeah. right? Right. So, yep. you know, you, you do a little bit of work, you put a proposal out and then you just see what people respond, how people respond it. And that will give you a really good sentiment of like, okay, is this language feature, is this framework um, going to be heavily adopted or are people just not going to use it, right? Um, right. Which I think is, is a great way to, to gather feedback versus only talking to customers that want to be on that bleeding edge or talking to developers that only want to be on that bleeding edge, right? Because um, mm -hmm. there's definitely folks like that. You know, you, you know, said that you're one of them, right? Like, yeah. there's, but there's some people that are like, don't give me new stuff. Like, I'm fine with this thing the way it is. Give me things that I want, even though I'm not going to tell you what I want. Um, so it's always very a, a very delicate balance, I guess you could say. Right. It's like um, there, there's certainly uh, people in our industry who have 
strong opinions when it conflicts with their non-opinionated aspect of development. Like, <laughs> so, so I, I guess to speak to that more directly, like there's in my career, there's been notably, uh, I, I almost refer to them as like lifers, like developers who are always going to be at the same company, don't ever want to do anything that's like new or challenging. Uh, and, and a new thing comes out and it, they just, you know, wave it off as we've seen many of new things in my career. I don't care. This is my bread and butter. Yes. Uh, but, yes. but I, I think some of the problem, uh, problems with that specifically are, uh, eventually they end up getting left behind because things move so quickly. Yeah. And I think the Excel, like, that's a great, good point too. Like how fast things move and how things are so accelerated. I mean, and this is maybe just me being extra, but like as somebody who's like new to tech, like trying to absorb all these different um, learning channels, all these different tool options, yada, yada, yada. Like there's so much that I just need to figure out like what path do I want to go down? Because I do honestly think that being a generalist now is impossible. Like right. you can't be a front end, back end, DevOps, multi-cloud, like engineer. You can't. You can't. <laughs> like if, even if you are, like your day is probably miserable and you work like 70 hours, 100 hours a week, right? Like, cause I, so I think like we've moved more in tech to be more, cause I feel like at one point in time we were very generalist. Like there was a lot of people <clears> that like the, the idea of like a full stack developer was like the most used title in all of the world. Now I think we're kind of getting into these more specialist roles, which is good and bad. But I think in general, like with the, the whole lot of options that we have to choose from, it still makes things really hard. Yeah. So I think that's an interesting, um, uh, observation. So the, the whole, I know that I've had conversations in the past with, uh, the debate on whether or not like a full stack developer really exists anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, and I've always said it can, it just sure. depends. Yeah. Like, um, I mean, w when I was doing consulting, there'd be uh, a commit I'd push that would have CSS changes. The next one after that would be SQL database changes. The one after that would be JavaScript changes. The next one after that's .NET changes. So it's like, is that the full stack? I mean, yeah. they're also updating like the, you know, delivery pipelines. So it's like, what do you consider the full stack? So. Yeah. And I think, you know, the full, like full stack, like if you're building like a web app, I think by default, you're kind of a full stack developer, if, especially if you have to do UI work, right? Because there is a back end mm -hmm. piece to it and it's going to be deployed probably on a cloud, right? So I think there is, that is a full stack thing, but like you, like it's very specialized as it pertains to the technologies that you're going to be using, right? I think once you start to get into this space where like, hey, we need to be able to deploy to AWS and Azure and GCP and these are on a Kubernetes and it's a Svelte app that's using, you know, CSS, whatever, or, or you know, um, Kailwind CS, like it becomes way too much, right? And I know mm -hmm. that at some point in time, like once the tools are decided, it becomes less work. But I think that initial like, okay, what, because at the end of the day, we all have to learn all of it, right? Like, sure, we're going to mm -hmm. use the internet to search a ton. Um but at the end of the day, like you need to know like the base level concepts of all these things to to at least be productive. And I think right. getting to that point where you are productive to an extent is really, really hard, especially when you're getting started. Yeah. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Yeah. I, I think one thing that I would love to talk to you about, and we, we kind of alluded to it a little bit earlier, is like you made this trend that kind of this transition in your career to focus like you were a dev shipping code every day, like, or, you know, even when you're a solutions architect, I don't know if you're shipping code, but you're, you know, very technical having these conversations with customers trying to solve their problems. And then you kind of made a pivot to, you know, be a content author, technical writer, you know, mm -hmm. I would, you know, whatever title you want to give yourself, like, I'd love to kind of think about what was going through your head as you were considering that decision and, and how you end up came about making it. Yeah, so uh, I think it all kickstarted with build. Uh, I think it was 2016, maybe or 2015. But I had gone and I was inspired by what I saw there. And you mm -hmm. know, this is the early rumblings of .NET Core, and um, you know, at the time even Angular. And so I eventually ended up becoming um, a Microsoft MVP. And as part of that, there's almost been like this unspoken thing, like where 
it, it seems as though lots of MVPs eventually end up becoming a Microsoft employee. Sure. Uh, sure. And, and this was and this was pre um, pandemic, but you know, as so I've been with Microsoft now for three years, uh, but when I was doing like the consulting and technical evangelism role, like I was traveling and speaking a ton. Um, and it was something I didn't want to do as much anymore because it was just very, very taxing. You know, when sure. you're going and giving, you know, 24 talks in a year, for example, yeah, it's it's exhausting. It's hard on the family and I've got a young family. So it's something I had to certainly, you know, prioritize. So uh, to that end, I was exploring um, opportunities um, and it had to be remote. Um, mm -hmm. And the only opportunities that I was able to find was um, uh, a content developer role. So I applied and uh, they, you know, flew out to Redmond and, um, you know, the kind of the rest is history. But I initially started over in the Azure docs and now I landed uh, in my very welcoming home here of the .NET docs. Sure. So I'm very uh, close to, uh, you know, the, the product team um, interfacing with lots of them regularly and uh, just, you know, hopefully providing impactful uh, observations and learned experiences and, you know, technical code and, and corresponding content. So. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of, and I say this a lot, like being a developer or being an engineer is a very creative art form. And I think, um, you, I'm not saying every developer ends up writing a lot of stuff. Like you write technical documentation or you write just internal docs or whatever, or maybe you blog, but there is like this kind of, there is this little bit of connective tissue between, like the code that you write and like the education standpoint, right? Which I think you fall into. What is it about content writing or blogging or that medium that really excites you? Uh, it's the creative freedom of it all. Yeah. And the, the fact that, you know, my learned experiences and, and, and writing like, you know, enterprise applications, for example, can be applied uh, one to one with anything that I'm I'm working on, mm -hmm. like I get to, um, I think it's really energizing to know that content that I write is being consumed by, you know, literally millions of developers around yeah. the world, who are copying and pasting my code and using it to, uh, you know, build out their livelihood, build out applications, build out uh, products, build out entire companies. So it's it's really, it's inspiring. Like I wrote some uh, blog posts, uh, you know, through uh, the the Twilio author program. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm, I'm a Twilio champion um, and I'm also a Google developer expert. So, uh, you know, with, with Twilio though, specifically, uh, I've written blogs like doing video chat um, applications sure. with Angular and that app, the, the repository, it's all open source. I get um, some very consistent emails uh, and, um, you know, people reaching out to me saying, Hey, we took this app and it's now the core of our business. Like we are, we built a business around it. We've got a video conferencing business. Um, there's this bug, our developers tweaked some things. We made this and did that. Can you help us, you know, maintain it? And it's like, wait, yeah. what, <laughs> what is going yeah, on? Yeah. 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 So like, that's, that's so inspiring just to think that, you know, um, the, the stuff that I like to write th the most isn't like demo where it's, mm -hmm. it's truly like, you know, it, it's a substantial, like real world application. Yeah. And that, um, that transitions really, really well to, I think one of the last things I'd love to talk with you about, and we were talking a lot, a little bit, um, before we got started, but you are in the process of becoming a published author. And I would love to kind of get, you know, maybe talk about a little bit, the, the origin of that and how that came about and obviously what the book's about and wh what you're hoping to gain from it. Yeah, yeah. So through my years as um, uh, a technical evangelist, um, I, you know, I've been approached by different publishers through the years. Like, so I've been reached out to by Pact, A Press, Manning, and then you know, finally, O'Reilly, uh, uh, or sorry, O'Reilly Media reached out. Uh, and when they reached out to me, it was like, all right, this is you know one of the Serious, biggest names, yeah. and, and so it's like. I, I have to at least consider it. And it was during the pandemic. So I was already at a point where I wasn't traveling and doing speaking. So it's like, yeah. not that I had downtime or free time, but it was like, you know, it was one of those come to Jesus moments where I had to like think sure. about it. So yeah. um, I was a bit taken aback. And, you know, I was like, have you reached out to any other people? Because 
you know, why me? Like, why, you know, th they were specifically reaching out about Blazer. So it's something I was, you know, kind of enthralled by. So I agreed to do it. Um, and it, it was a really interesting process. So they have you kind of uh, write a proposal and, you know, you work real closely with an acquisitions editor and, uh, you know, it's, it's still kind of weird to say, oh, you know, I'm, you know, interfacing with this publisher, yeah, my sure. publisher, right? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, but yeah, I just, I just recently, uh, submitted the, the draft. Um, so it's, it's, it's going undergoing technical review. And so each chapter has, you know, about five different technical reviewers, you know, subject matter experts that are, you know, picking it apart and analyzing it and making sure it sounds correctly and it's presented in a, a meaningful manner. Um, but for me, this is my first book. You know, I've written many a blogs before. I've, I've met, written for the docs, you know, professionally. I've done uh, other things. You know, I was a, a poet and a songwriter for many, many years, uh, you know, past life. Um, so this was a, an entirely different um, uh, approach to, you know, kind of creative expression. So I didn't want it to be like a traditional tech book. Um, to me, uh, you know, a lot of tech books are, um, and this is just my opinion, they're, they're a bit dry and it's, it's hard to, you know, kind of be inspired by it and, and follow along. And some of them like to, uh, you know, almost kind of replicate what the docs might already have. So I didn't want that for my book. I wanted my book to be uh, special and different and unique. And the way I was, uh, the way I'm trying to do that is to have it such that imagine you're a developer, right? Pretty easy to imagine. And you're dropped into a new engagement uh, or a new project um, or a new code base. That's that's where the, the mind frame of the book comes in because that's, that's literally what happens. You're not going to have a bunch of like broken down examples. Like it's a huge application. Um, the Learning Blazor repository is over 90,000 lines of code right now. Mm -hmm. There's 90, 17 projects. 90,000. 90,000. <laughs> zero, 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 zero. Okay. <laughs> yeah. For a book. Um, all right. Yeah. That's, so yeah. there's a lot to it, though. And and yeah. all those moving pieces, like, you know, we go through in excruciating detail. And the idea is to really bring you up to speed on what is possible mm -hmm. to inspire you as the reader to be like, you know what? holy cow, I didn't know I could do native speech synthesis. I didn't yeah. know I had access to geolocation. I didn't know we could use Roslyn's APIs for source generated Blazor JavaScript interop. Like, oh my God, all these crazy things, right? Mm -hmm. And it's all it's all in the book. So yeah, yeah. and I, I'm going to summarize, I think how I took, when you were talking to me about the book a bit earlier and I was like, oh snap. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's, Stepping away from traditional books that are, I guess, more reference architecture and mm. to more um, problem solving with examples, right? Like, and I think that's something that's really, really impactful. Like, as somebody who's joined a, a team many times in my career and been given, been given tasks, whether they're maintaining existing apps or trying to enhance existing apps or even building new apps, like, there, there is a need for like, okay, where do I start? What are some of the things that I need to do? And like going, like spelling out that process and going through the, like also going through the process of like building a piece of reference material. It's, you said it's on GitHub, right? So mm -hmm. like get on GitHub, which means that you're going to be held accountable to up, to keep that thing up to date for forever. Right. Right. Um, which is only going to help sales of your book, obviously. Um, <laughs> But I think like that's a brilliant idea. Like it, it harkens back and we talked about this a little bit earlier. Like, you know, you get code magazines in the mail and like they would define a problem they're trying to solve and you know, they would, you know, show, oh, this is what my, you know, base class library looks like and this is what my API looks like. And at the end of it, like if you followed along, you'd like have a running app, right? Like right. that is so interesting in comparison to like, okay, here's some Here's some sample code on like how to do dependency injection for static sites or something like that, right? I know right. that there's documentation for that. I can find it. Um, but like something that's real is really interesting. Also, I imagine that that's also terrifying for you because now your code is going to be in public, like not just like sample code, but like code that people are going to look at with a fine tooth comb and say, oh, David, I don't know if you sh this is the right approach to do here. So I hope that you... Um, 
you've had an opportunity to like get some outside input just to make sure that you're following, you know, the things that you want to address with the code base, which I think would be really interesting. Yeah, I've been actively developing it while writing the book, yeah. mm -hmm. um, but I only gave myself a month. Like when I when I initially had like the negotiations for the contract with O'Reilly, I said, give me a month to write the basis app for the book. Um, so the majority of it was written in a month. Mm. So if anything, it's it's a selfish learning opportunity yeah. like where, you know, hopefully others jump in there and uh, it is opinionated and it is highly technical. And there are uh, many things that I've done uh, that others might not necessarily agree with. And that's yeah. okay, right? There's mm -hmm. there's literally endless ways to achieve the exact same thing in software. Yep. And that's kind of the beauty of it. This is the way I express how I think it should be done. Um, and I'm I'm very open though. Like I would love to uh, learn new patterns or sure. you know best practices or um, and, and I'm very humble in that way. Like if someone comes to me and they're like, "Hey, David, you're a moron," I'm not gonna be like, "Err." I mean, I might be like that inside. I might be, "Oh, that hurts my feelings." But at the end of the day, hopefully, I'm learning something from it. Right? That's what I want this to be as like a learning experience, not just for the reader, but for myself. Yeah, I mean that's and that's a really healthy way to go about things too, right? Like not caring what people because uh, like to our comment the uh, comment i made earlier like the people that have the bad things to say are usually vocal more vocal than than not but i think just going through the process of building something like you know you're probably going to look at this code in a couple of years and you'll be like oh i probably should have done something else because that's just how life works um <laughs> but i think one thing that's also really interesting about this this approach that you're taking to the book is that it creates like another layer of um I guess you could say connectivity with the end audience, right? Like, mm -hmm. because now if they have questions, they can open up issues on your repo. If they have questions about the book, like obviously you're very approachable online anyway, but you have the ability to like really double click into like providing that value, which I think, you know, if you're going to write a book and spend all of the months required to write a book and building like this, this, um, this sample application, like, you want, like, obviously the money is very important too, but you want to feel like you're giving back to some level of audience, right? Um, so, like, what have you taken from the book? Like, I, you mentioned earlier that, like, it's been a very interesting experience. Like, have you found, like, any, um, you know, areas of your, like, your work style or, or things that you've learned about yourself as, as, through this process that you'd like to share? Um, yeah, I, I've, I think I've discovered that... Um... Every time I share the basis app, everyone always says, oh, wow, uh, well, why would you do such a large app? Why would you do yeah. so many moving yeah. pieces? And um, and I always think to myself, go big or go home. So yeah. the app the app has, um, I have a little, some of the feature lists here. I'm just going to ramble off so people have a, kind of a, an idea of, of where it's going. So it's got uh, Blazor, third-party authentication providers. It's got Google, Twitter. Um, GitHub, it's got Azure Active Directory B2C. Uh, it's using Azure Functions and Spots. It's using the minimal APIs. It's using ASP.NET Core Web APIs. It's using ASP.NET Core uh, SignalR, Bulma CSS, Poly for HTTP fault, uh, fault tolerance. Um, it's got Swagger, Open APIs, Twitter APIs, the Open Weather Map API, Have I Been Pwned. Um, it's got client size. Uh, native speech synthesis and recognition. It's using reactive extensions in places. Um, uh, Cosmos DB, uh, WebAssembly, localization. Everything. It's got everything in it, David. You know, you keep the, list, the, yeah, the list goes, it goes on. on. There, and and I'm, a, so much. <laughs> and, and I'm um, just for folks that are um, listening in later, like I'm going through like the, uh, the GitHub repository because it's public on GitHub and I'll make sure that in the show notes there's a link to it. But I mean... Like I'm looking like 366 commits to date and today's June 6th, June 7th, right? Like, you know, David was committing code 16 hours ago. So like, this is something that's like <laughs> very, very impressive. Right. And like, obviously there's a goal in mind is to kind of help, um, you know, be like a, a complimentary piece to this other thing that he's doing. But like, this is something that, and I'm just going to get on a rant. So I apologize. Like one of the biggest things that people always talk about, like, cause I used to work, at Microsoft, like building content that was like, I guess, end to end sort of content. And the question that I would always ask, like, what sort of content would you like to see? And like, 
the, most of the things that you just listed are like what people are asking for. Like I want real world right. scenarios. I want to be able to like connective to connective tissue to all these different services. How do I do this with that? Like, I mean, I don't want to um, pump this too much because I think that there's a better time to pump it, especially when the book comes out. But like, this is a, this is a reference to like how to do like, again, very opinionated, how to do modern application development with .NET and Blazor, right? Which mm -hmm. is, in my opinion, very, very needed because not just because it's going to help you sell your book, but also because it's what people are always asking for. Like we've always had this issue in tech in general where we do two, two sorts of samples well. We do the Hello World sample and we do the sample that is so complicated and so bespoke to what we're trying to, the point we're trying to get across, that it's almost impossible for somebody to just go and clone it and run it, right? And you need to provide all this documentation and all these things. And usually you're providing like build scripts and, you know, different, you know, you know PowerShell commands and things like that. And I, my hope is when this is all done, and I have a feeling it will be because I have a lot of respect for the work that you do, is like this is a clone and build and it works and sure you might have to provide some third party integration like keys and such but at the end of the day like it's just going to work which i think right. is the biggest challenge of github in general right like going out and finding something that works and answers the question that you have like that's a job in and of itself right the amount of npm packages that i've downloaded that just don't do what i want um is too damn high right yeah, that's the idea. Uh, I think there's one required setting and you can set it to demo, but then it should just be, and I do even have like a getting started in here, like how to, like what what's required yeah. and what's optional. Um, but a lot of it is based on other like peripheral open source packages, you know, mm -hmm. through like NuGet. Um, so I maintain many other uh, things out there and I've been neglecting them while I'm writing the book. Sure. Um, so I, I think, you know, one of the lessons learned is uh, don't overcommit myself to uh, other, you know, kind of late evening, um, you know, open source project hacking because I could do that as a full time job. Yeah. It's so much fun. <laughs> like how often did you fall? And this is just a, a, a inside question that I'd love to kind of get your thought. Like how often did you fall into like technical writer mode? Like I have a problem trying to solve like. For instance, your job is like writing docs for ASP.NET, mm -hmm. .NET, right? Like how mm -hmm. often did you catch yourself kind of falling into like that sort of prose, that um, that delivery mechanism? Because obviously like docs are substantially different than writing books, right? Mm -hmm. Like the tone is a bit different and all that. Like how often did you catch yourself kind of falling into like, oh, I'm writing a doc and you had to jump out of it immediately? Uh, never. Oh. It's, 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 well, uh, so the interesting thing is like, uh, docs, uh, everything on docs.microsoft.com is based on Markdown. Yeah. So what I learned with O'Reilly is they use ASCII doc, mm -hmm. which is similar to Markdown. It's, it, it's another markup language that can yep. then be turned into HTML or, um, like ePublish, uh, or other, there's a, a other format as well, but PDF, I think. Um, so. I had to learn another markup language sure. as part of this and a whole set of like different tooling. And um, so that was kind of a learning curve. So when I was writing though, uh, I just, I got into a different mindset sure. um, where it wasn't nearly as, you know, structured and like the tone could be more free form. Cause it's, you know, I'm trying to take the reader on a journey. Yep. So I, I kind of always would embrace that mindset. Like, you know, my editorial um, editor uh, is amazing at O'Reilly. She she would kind of coach me on how I should be um, like presenting this content. Sure. And she said, one of the best things to do is just imagine that you're standing behind the developer that you're coaching along the yeah. way and you're both looking at the code together. So it's almost like we're pairing. Yeah, I think that's, I mean, that's also a great way to just educate in general right like have yeah. that empathy for the end user the the person that's consuming the content because you don't know where they're at in their professional career or what right. their you know where their interest level is right i jokingly say this all the time like you can't assume everybody speaks the same language right right like i think we in at times in tech just assume that everybody is on the same level of us when we talk um and that was one of the things when i first started public speaking that i was like oh 
Like I have everybody in the room that has never heard of what I'm talking about to people that are literally there because they have a question at the end of the talk and they're just sitting there waiting for, waiting for the talk to be done because they can come up and ask me a question. So like right. every single and everything in between and, you know, having that empathy of everybody that might consume your book or your doc or your GitHub repository, they're not all at the same level. So you have to, right. you know, unfortunately for the folks that might be a bit more advanced, like they might have to read some stuff that's kind of getting more getting started because I think you need to start at that lowest level at all times because you can't assume everybody's already getting started. Right. Yeah. So we're at the end of our time. And again, David, I want to thank you so much for, for coming on and chatting. This has been really great. It's great to catch up, but also just to hear about some of the things that you've been working on. And I'm excited about the book. Um, so, you know, I, I pasted a link to the, some information about the book on our Realize website. So take a look at that. Um, obviously follow David on Twitter if you're not already, which you need to David Pine seven, um, to get some more information about the book and just all the other stuff that he's working on. Do you have anything else parting to say, David? No, just, uh, I mean, thanks for having me on. This has been great. Always nice to catch up. Yeah. And I have one more question at the end of, uh, all of our conversations here. I love to ask my guest, if they can, you know, kind of think about tech and open source, the community around it, and they only had one word to define that feeling, what would that word be for you? Inspiring. Inspiring. Yeah. Do you have a reasoning for inspiring? Or I think it's pretty straightforward. It's it's very straightforward. Yeah. Yeah. That's the 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 world is at our fingertips, and developers rule the world. We can do whatever we want. This is crazy. Very, very true. <laughs> Excellent. Well, uh, for David, um, I want to thank you folks for tuning in uh, and for listening in if you're following us on uh, podcast. Um, this has been a great conversation. Hope to see you next time. I'm Isaac Levin, Coffee and Open Source. Take care, everybody.